the funding winter is increasingly getting intense. Now the funding winter that has startups shivering is getting bleaker. The funding winter. Funding winter. Funding winter. Funding challenges faced. Lack of funding. The funding winter is here. Here is here. After almost a year of drought, last week, Zepto raised $200 million. Oil founder announced that the company has become cash flow positive for the very first time. Zomato has reported net profits for the first time ever. And Swiggy's food business has turned profitable nine years after its inception. But is this a sign that things are getting better is the question. I've been following Indian startup ecosystem for over a decade now. It began with the e-commerce boom, with the rise of startups like Flipkart, Mintra and Snapdeal. And this was followed by the whole fintech boom, first with wallet apps and then payment apps after UPI. And most recently, we saw the boom of edtech during the pandemic. In this period, if I have to pinpoint one year which had the most ups and downs, it's got to be 2023. The year started with a global slowdown in terms of economy, and Indian startups had to face the brunt as well. It went through something called funding winter where if you're a loss-making startup, it became very difficult to raise money. So many startups had to shut down due to the lack of funding. But this also pushed Indian startups towards maturity. They started looking for profitability. And it happened across sectors, whether it's food delivery apps like Zomato and Swiggy, or edtech companies like Unacademy, or cab-hailing business Ola. Every leading company has either turned profitable or will do so in 2024. So what really led to this? How did the startups that could not show profits for decades Decades managed to do it in just few months. And what role did VCs play in this? Let's understand all of this in this video. India has constantly been one of the fastest growing economies in the world after China. And one of the biggest reasons for China's economic growth was its growing middle class. Why? See, as incomes rise, so does consumption. That's when people start paying for luxury items and start valuing time over money. Basically, the more people get into the middle class, the more a country spends on products and services overall. This spending is then captured by the companies that create those products and services. And that in turn drives economic growth for the entire country. Around 2016, there was a lot of talk about India's middle class. While the economists estimated that India's middle class consisted of 78 million people, there was another report which had pegged this number at a massive 600 million. And this was half of India's population at the time. One thing was certain, India's middle class was growing. Then in 2016, we had the Geo Revolution, which has since made internet accessible to everyone in the country in the last seven years. And thanks to Geo, the number of internet users have doubled from just under 400 million people to almost 900 million now. And finally, there was the launch of UPI, which made digital payments as simple as the click of a button. And in case you're wondering how these three things are connected, let me explain it to you. India had a huge growing middle class population. Fast internet made it easy for tech companies to reach this growing middle class and achieve scale in a very short amount of time. And UPI, it made it easy for these companies to monetize whatever they were building. This was the thesis that was sold to the VCs and it was an irresistible opportunity for any VC to pass on. India was seen as the next big opportunity after China and no one wanted to miss this gravy train. And people jumped on this. Just look at these numbers. Funding in Indian startups has continued to grow since 2016. But this gravy train could not go on forever before pumping the brakes. Till the time money was flowing in India, the startups were busy following the blitz scaling model of growth. The basic idea was to build a product and then throw money into marketing to get as many users as possible. This is why most of the leading startups in India were making millions if not billions of dollars of losses without generating any revenue. Cred is the perfect example of this type of growth. And once they get enough users, then they start finding ways to monetize them. But there are a few problems with this model. First, you never know when the VC money would stop coming. And once it did, the startups would get in trouble or in some cases even shut down. Just look at what's happening with Dunzo. They've burned millions of dollars competing in the quick commerce market. But now that they can't get more money, they're finding it hard even to survive. See, VCs believed in Indian entrepreneurs and the vision they had sold to them. But VCs usually start looking for an exit within 7 to 10 years of investment. No matter how grand the vision is, they are ultimately there to make money. And they were comfortable pouring billions of dollars into Indian startups in the hope of making huge profits in the future. They were seeking the kind of success Tiger Global had seen with Flipkart. And one thing to note here is that most VCs that invest in Indian startups are actually from the US. These VCs had access to a lot of cheap money when the Fed kept the interest rates very low. 
and they were using that money to put into the Indian markets as the distance between US and China kept on increasing. But as soon as the market started recovering after 2020, those interest rates started to go up. The free flow of cheap money was coming to an end. There was now pressure on these VCs to make profits that they were promised before they could put in more money and their exit period was fast approaching. But they were in for a rude surprise. Even though most of these companies had tens of crores of users, most of them were not willing to pay. They had grossly overestimated the market and the time it would take to grow. Even though India has close to 900 million internet users, only around 45 million users are responsible for 50% of the entire country's spending. That's just 5% of the total internet users. Just take a look at these numbers. India's leading food delivery company Zomato, which at one time was present in over 1000 cities and towns, only managed to get around 58 million annual users. And even that growth has started to slow down and they're looking for new opportunities to grow. So now on the one hand, you had these startups who could not generate any meaningful revenue or profits. And then you have the VCs on the other side who are desperately looking for an exit. And the only way for them to get that exit was through the IPO as no new investors were coming in. And if they were, they were asking for lower valuations now that these valuations were not making sense. That's the reason you have seen a lot of startup IPOs in the last two years and a lot more in the works. Their 2023 taught Indian startups to do something they hadn't learned to do over the last decade. They were taught to build sustainable businesses. Just take a look at this list. All these companies that you see in this list they turned profitable this year. But how did they finally manage to become profitable? Let's understand that by taking three examples, Oyo, Zomato and Unacademy, three big companies from three different sectors. Let's begin with Oyo. Oyo was started in 2013, raised over $3 billion was valued at $10 billion at its peak, but was never profitable. That was until the Q4 of FY23. So what changed? See, Oyo had posted over 13,000 crore rupees in losses during the pandemic year. That made them realize something important. The huge number of hotels in their portfolio wasn't a thing to brag about, but a liability. There was a cost associated with maintaining and managing each of these hotels. The first thing they did was to cut the number of hotels they had. At their peak, they had over 23,000 hotels, which is now down to just 12,546. The idea was to focus on revenue per hotel. Next, they changed their business model from offering minimum guarantee income to a revenue sharing model which again helped in cutting down their fixed costs. And finally, they started focusing on premium customers by adding premium brands like Pallet and adding programs like Spotless Stay and Super Oyo to focus on quality. In the case of Zomato, they have been in business since 2008 and it took them 15 years to post a profit for the first time. But what's amazing about them is they're the only second online food delivery company in the world to do so. And how did they do it? They followed the 80-20 principle called the Pareto principle. It simply means that 80% of all outcomes comes from just 20% of the efforts. In Zomato's case, it means that the majority of their revenue was coming from a small fraction of their users. In fact, just 5% of their users were responsible for 45% of all the orders on their platform. And it's safe to say that these power users were coming from the metro cities. Why do I think so? Well, because Zomato decided to stop their operations in 225 small cities earlier this year. They decided to focus on these power users instead of just expanding mindlessly. Once they realized that, they launched their loyalty program Zomato Gold to give special features to these users, from offering free deliveries to no delay guarantee and exclusive offers and discounts. And it worked. They now have 3.8 million gold users who account for more than 40% of all Zomato's orders. By cutting down on mindless growth and focusing on the users that matter is how Zomato was able to become profitable. And finally, Unacademy, the company that was burning over 200 100 crore rupees every month in 2021 and they have brought their cash burn down to just 1.9 crore in 2023. That's an impressive 99% reduction in cash burn and this has been a key factor in helping them turn cash flow positive. But how did they do it? Well, once Gaurav Munjal, the founder of Unacademy, figured out that the funding winter was coming, he decided to go on a cost-cutting spree. First, Unacademy laid off more than 60% of its workforce. After it decided to shut down or scale down all the no core businesses. They started prioritizing their core test preparation business. They have also realized that offline is where real money is. And that's where Unacademy is focusing now. And this is driving most of their growth now. In the end, what can we as future entrepreneurs learn from 2023? I think the biggest lesson here is to build a business that is independent of the VCs. 
a business that is sustainable in itself. See, there's nothing wrong with using VC money to scale your business, but you need to first figure out if the market you're building for can pay for your product. You can keep getting users by putting in the VC money and become a huge company based just on those numbers. But it means nothing if none of those users are willing to or have the capacity to pay for your product. Alright, that's all I have for you in this video and I'll see you in the next one.